Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Tired Boys podcast. I'm your host, Justin. And I'm Aaron. Welcome back, everyone. We've got a fun episode looking forward at the Chinese Grand Prix this week. We'll also look back at the the history and uh, some of the races that have uh, happened here at the Shanghai Circuit um, over the, the past decade and a half or so. Um, and some quick hitters, a lot of the usual, but Justin, it's good to see you. Good to be back for another week. Yeah, good to see you too, my man. It's uh, an, an interesting one here this week. We're talking about, like you said, uh, the Chinese Grand Prix, which is one that, like, when Aaron and I came into it, it was around, well, Aaron, like, before before me but when i came into it it was like 2018 2019 era so this is a track really that i put would only have seen most likely just from drive to survive actually um so it was actually kind of neat to go back and like really get a a a sense of the track fully and and kind of learn about it um so that's what we got in store for you here today Uh, but before we get into all that let's just roll the intro really quickly Just You're not too D. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so oh. it, was, it was it was fun to reach out and touch you, my friend. Circuit of the Americas is where it's a track that is was created for racing. So uh, it, the race is a flat fee, and then it's and it's the bake off afterwards where things get really kooky. Okay, that's where all the weirdness comes in. Mercedes definitely started planning for their new car if if rebel came out it was just like adrian knew he designed our car yeah (laughs) whoa yeah did he really no way all right very cool now yeah to talk about the um you know the chinese grand prix here in a little bit but aaron first why don't you set us up with some quick hitters here for us yeah so the uh the first one i wanted to just talk about a little bit was Andretti uh, just in general so they recently opened a new factory in Silverstone uh, to kind of continue to pursue their um, their goal of joining the Formula One championship Uh, so continuing to kind of really show that they are in it to build a competitive car, be competitive, not just be a um, kind of a, a extra split of the winnings on the grid, but someone who can actually uh, compete at that level. Um, and so that's, uh, a, of course, pretty big statement um, opening that facility nearby a number of the other uh f1 locations we have mercedes uh who has the the factory in silverstone um i believe aston martin and red bull also have facilities in silverstone so kind of going to that hub um but they also are potentially looking at joining f2 and f3 uh to hopefully be able to start building um their own kind of junior drivers program so that by the time that they hope to be in F1, they'll have already kind of set the foundation to hopefully, uh, it seems like their goal is to bring American drivers in uh, through F2 and F3 um, up to Formula One. So I do, um, I think it's intriguing, but at the same time, I'm curious if it's going to be kind of a, uh more targeted at only american drivers or if they're planning to to just kind of try and look for american talent as well as field talent from uh like other countries as well sure i mean it sounds like a hopeful idea to want to you know take american talent um i imagine you know they'd be open to pivoting if say their their first couple of drivers don't really work out they say ah, maybe the maybe the american market actually isn't that um isn't that we suck know, at flush with talent <laughs> yeah um so i think the most interesting part of that conversation is the like looking for an f2 or an f3 entry um because that helps to shore up one of the issues that you know the 
uh, I guess the teams and the FIA kind of rebuffed against the the application was, you know, how competitive are they really going to be? Like, you know, like you had said, we don't just want them to be a split of the winnings. Um, we would actually want to see a competitive team. That would be a way, you know, an entry into F2 and F3, that would be a way for them to kind of prove their uh prove their medal in that regard and say like yeah like we're providing you know race competitive or you know god forbid even race winning cars you know for these f2 and f3 drivers that's something that could at least peak further interest from the teams in the fia to say like you know do we want a new entrant yeah and i i think it does it definitely opens more doors um i do kind of wonder if they are kind of dipping their toes too far into the water almost uh i think it feels like they're putting a lot of money and effort forth to uh to do this and to kind of push in this direction and so that is a, a decent gamble when the f1 teams have a say in in everything um, but on the other hand, there uh, was also a report recently that, guess who, Helmut Marko's out there talking about stuff again. Uh, oh, yeah. And, <laughs> uh, he was quoted as uh, saying that Red Bull could potentially sell the second team. Uh, and so that would be, of course, another way that Andretti could enter the, enter the playing field. Um of course, that's just something that I think Helmut Marco recycles every six months or so, where he's like, mm-hmm. maybe like we could sell the team, and everyone gets uh, all excited, and then nothing happens. I'm like, no, nah, we're we're keeping them and calling them V Carb. Hey, you know, you just gotta you gotta drum up some interest somewhere, man. Yeah, but uh, but I think it's an interesting thing. Of course, we've talked about keeping an eye on Andretti and the application uh, and kind of the, the progress from that. But mm-hmm. I think they're just continuing to, to take the right steps to put themselves in a position to be um, wanted in F1 as a, as a good competitor uh, that will bring more draw and more value to the sport. So the... Um, yeah, the growth of that program and everything, um, it'll be interesting and interesting to see if they do end up getting that entry into F2 or F3 um, anytime soon to be able to to start building that up. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, it is uh, it is the American way. Go big or go home. You know, we're uh, we're going to jam our way through whether, you know, whether you guys like it or not. Yeah. So, uh Pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Um, some other interesting uh, points of topic, one being Mr. Adrian Newey, uh, mm-hmm. who was report- reported to have been seen in Italy um, mm. recently at the airport. So potentially uh, these rumors of Ferrari and talks with Adrian Newey to bring him on board could be in the works still. Um Maybe he he believes that they have a a good potential and good design that he can just turn into another rocket ship. Um, But it's, I mean, that that would be a massive loss for Red Bull and and a huge gain for Ferrari. Um, Mm -hmm. It it really is kind of just almost as big of a signing as some of these driver signings uh in that case you don't typically have uh a person like engineering wise and whatnot that gets that kind of uh that kind of buzz so definitely uh, an interesting thought yeah, um, I, you know, this is this is just a man in, you know, let's say enemy territory. Um, I, I don't want to speculate too much, but my my first instinct on hearing this is keep your enemies close and your 
something about friends. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. I think go. my man, he's just going to try out the Ferrari champagne, see what brand they buy. Is it two ply or is it three ply here in the bathroom? I really think he just wants to get a lay of the land and get a couple of bugs on the wall. You know, a little bit of film, okay, a little okay. bit of audio going. It's this is a this is a, a a deep six spy mission I think here from from Mr. Nui. That that's that's my sense of it. Just Oceans Twenty Four, um, just diving right in, diving right in. This is Twenty Twenty Four is actually a heist. Yep. Dun, stealing dun, dun, stealing dun, 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 another dun. championship um right <laughs> but i i do think that uh of course it would be a pretty big move but i i just don't know if i can imagine it at this point in Nui's career uh to some extent i feel like the likelihood of him retiring it might actually be pretty high as well i mean oh, he's okay. getting He's getting older. Um, he's done a lot in F1, and I'm sure at some point he doesn't necessarily want to start like an entirely new project of X amount of years if he if he does have those kinds of plans. So sure. yeah, just uh, just an interesting uh, topic, and of course all the the people at the uh, the airport in Italy knew exactly who he was when he when he stepped on through um or he has a a really good doppelganger out there so i mean he was i mean he was probably just in his red bull you know his red bull (laughs) uniform full regalia i mean it it, just like a cartoon character probably the only thing he has in his closet just takes the red bull shirt down puts it on yes that's my sense of it less things to worry about more time to think about engineering Dude, that's the that's the Zuckerberg way, man. Yeah, but uh, but to move along in the quick hitters, uh, Kimi Antonelli, of course, we've talked about him being the potential replacement for Lewis Hamilton in the Mercedes seat uh, today and tomorrow, April sixteenth and seventeenth. He's getting the opportunity to test out one of the uh, older Mercedes cars. I think Toto said that they're going to start him in the twenty twenty one Mercedes. Uh, for the testing so he could feel what a good Mercedes car feels like before uh, throwing him to the wolves in the 2022 car. Um, sure. But uh, he'll be having those tests at, I believe it's at the Red Bull ring today and tomorrow. Um, and we'll hopefully get to hear kind of how he does and, and how um, good of a feel he gets for the car as we're kind of anticipating he may be the the front runner still for that seat. Mhm. Yeah, that's a that's a big opportunity for the for the young driver obviously. Um a lot of eyes on him this year. Um so yeah, like you said, it'll just be interesting to see um if that's uh you know if that's where Mercedes Mercedes goes with it or if they're um you know if if they have still yet some other plans, maybe some other drivers to test. Uh so uh a big opportunity for a young driver and we'll see uh yeah we'll see how it shakes out yeah but uh moving moving into some more confirmed uh things here in f1 so uh there was honda um i guess some spokesperson for honda was talking to the media about their um future partnership they have with uh aston martin i believe that starts in 2026 if i remember correctly but Mm -hmm. um in discussing that they said that it the that honda has to part of their partnership and uh for the team to perform the best and kind of meet their their goals and everything would require honda being very honest with uh aston martin about uh the team and about what they think in terms of being able to provide uh a kind of top of the field car um and i assume that also includes uh decisions on driver lineup to some extent so uh of course the allusion to to lance stroll and not necessarily um stacking up to be uh to allow aston to be a championship winning team we've definitely seen uh him struggle in his competition with uh with his teammate fernando alonso now 
um, after last year and then for the start of this year. Um, just not feeling at super comfortable in the car. Uh, and so I, I feel like that would be, I mean, a, a relatively reasonable thing for, for Honda to look to potentially push for, for a change with that driver lineup. Um, Mm -hmm. and of course we, we have, uh, some confirmations of drivers for next year, but still a lot to go. Lance being one that hasn't officially been confirmed, but of course we just kind of all have this consideration that he has in a never ending contract until told otherwise. Um, yeah. So it feels, it feels pretty indefinite in that regard. Yeah. And kind of inevitable to some extent that, uh, we'll see him in the Aston Martin green next year, but in our segment, Do You Work Here? We do have the confirmation from Aston Martin of their other driver, uh, Fernando Alonso, being here to stay, uh, was his quote, just, I am here to stay. Um, it's all that he, <laughs> he had uh, to say for the matter. But I um, I mean, I think it's a great a great spot for him right now with Red Bull. I think there's probably too much up in the air uh, as a potential option in terms of where they want to go. And right now, Aston's ahead of Mercedes and seems to have really figured out the um, the pace and all uh, outside of the the struggles that they feel with like straight line speed, which would kind of more directly relate to their Mercedes power unit, which is. something that in a couple of years will be be switching over to Honda like we said so um Fernando here to stay what do you think do you feel like that's the the right move for for him or for Aston Martin or both uh it seems like the right move for both um I I don't believe his performance is wanting at all in in the Aston Martin. We've seen a number of podiums from him um, in in that in that car. So yeah, I I I think it's a a solid partnership. Um, interesting, I believe through twenty twenty six. So they'll be working together with the new honda regulations if if i'm understanding the timing properly um Mm. so that's really interesting you know alonzo's quoted to 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 be saying he is he feels the best both you know physically and mentally he believes he's driving really well um so clearly he believes in himself currently um and then also for the you know for the acid martin angle of it yeah i think he's a, a really marketable driver i think he's a solid driver on the grid he's competitive with some of the drivers that you would think of as like best on the grid even if not like in a winning car kind of thing um and yeah i think he's still comfortably in that conversation so yeah a very very exciting very exciting signing especially especially factoring in you know he was the one of the names that you know you would hear titters of you know in the corners of like oh is he going to mercedes so like you know here's here's another name off the list um you know for uh uh moves roster moves yeah and slowly solidifying the the grid for next year one at a time we only have uh five uh, drivers who have officially been confirmed, of course, with Lewis and Charles Leclerc, Lando mm-hmm. Norris, Oscar Piastri, um, George Russell, Max Verstappen, and sorry, so Alonso is the sixth, so we still okay. are uh, sitting with 14 outstanding uh, drivers for, uh, for the grid, so a lot to still get locked in, and, and like I said, previously in uh one of the episodes i think once the mercedes seat uh hammer kind of falls that will um Mm. go ahead and and kind of start the dominoes for a number of the other teams um as we're getting a little deeper in the year um some drivers i still anticipate being uh kind of confirmed before too long alex albon of course uh, at this rate, Yuki Sonoda, we said Lance mm-hmm. Stroll. So um, I, I think there's a good number that will be uh, getting locked in before before too, too long. Um, right. 
and like like, vi like fewer surprises to be had. Yeah, so not right. a, unless um, all of a sudden the Red Bull seat is uh, publicly open, um, as opposed to them kind of standing behind Checo as long as he continues to perform, um, mm -hmm. I, I am start. I feel like things are slowly starting to to fall into place here, um, mm -hmm. and we'll we'll definitely pick up, but. To start talking about the Chinese Grand Prix uh, and the history of it before we get into the upcoming race, um, we're going to be having, I guess it's the 20, how many Chinese Grand Prix have we had now? It's really not that many. I think it's it's 2004 to 2019 straight. So I believe that's like 15, 15 years um okay. 15 years running so then this will be the 16th running if i'm like doing the quick quick maths okay. properly so yeah 16th uh 16th running for the chinese grand prix at the shanghai circuit um i know you had a little bit of uh information on the circuit itself um so i'll let you go ahead and and talk about that a little bit yeah, one of the one of the most interesting things that I learned about the circuit um, was the name. Well, I should say like this was when I encountered the name Herman Tilka. Um, curious if I'm saying the last name properly, but Herman Tilka, I guess, is a quite prominent um, Formula One and other motorsport circuit designers so he has had a direct hand in many of the circuits like that we you know watch know love maybe dislike in some cases um so this guy seems to have done a lot of work on f1 circuits and most notably i think that like we would really recognize is Baku, Jetta, and Vegas, which are notably what are each of those? Baku, Jetta, and Vegas, um, streets, street circuits. Yeah, they're all street circuits. And one of, and this was actually what I thought in, was interesting. He's actually been criticized a good amount for his circuits. Criticized, saying that like they're all carbon copies of each other. They're boring, and they de incentivize overtaking, which is actually like when you think about just classic qualities of street tracks, just in general. Like those are all kind of it. Like you can't right really make them that interesting it's a lot of like 90 degree turns and things like this um so just to you know just to offer you know kind of two sides of the coin where um obviously he has some people would believe good tracks bad tracks but if you're looking at formula one circuits overall you encounter the name herman tilka a lot herman tilka is the gentleman that designed the shanghai international circuit uh which i which i thought was very interesting just a couple of just a couple of quick stats here it's a 4.45 kilometer track over 19 turns and i think one of the to my mind one of like the most interesting maybe like iconic maybe bits of character that the track has is actually the turn one two and three kind of little uh uh little combination so the first turn of the race it's actually this really really lazy right hander that just comes right back into like a pretty tight left hander for three um and it's a it's a very interesting turn that we don't see a lot of that style of turn um mm -hmm. where you're like where you're you're over rotate like you're coming like back in on itself but like at a at a quite wild clip um so that turn one and two is is very iconic as far as like just kind of um bird's eye view looking at the track so that's that's something to keep an eye out for on the during the races. Uh, it's a strong overtaking position. Obviously, you're coming out of DRS from the from the pit straight, um, so we can see a lot of good work getting done in that one, two, three little connection because you can make up a lot of speed there. You can get overtakes done. So just a, a, a little area of the track that's just rife with personality, in in, in my opinion. Um, so those are those are some of the interesting bits about the track. One thing that I thought was funny that like people can't stop talking about is the 
well, it's the most expensive track in the world. They said like 450 million or something like this. But since Abu Dhabi has been added, um, that's since been dwarfed. You know, Abu Dhabi is now the most expensive track. But previously, this held that record, which I I thought was kind of funny. Yeah, I uh, saw that a little bit when I was looking around. But uh, talking about Herman Tilke, uh, who I didn't realize until you were just saying uh, about Baku, Jeddah, and Vegas. Uh, I had seen on Twitter, uh, this is a little side tangent, but I had seen on Twitter there was this uh, racetrack built in Tokyo for, it's like a billionaire's private racetrack or something, but like people can like come and drive it or whatnot. But it's uh, it was designed by Herman Tilka because I remembered seeing the like same designer as designed dot 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 as I was going through the uh, the Twitter thread, but a very very cool looking track in the mountains of uh, outside of Tokyo that you can uh, see Mount Fuji in the distance. It's called oh, nice. the Magariga- Magarigawa Club. Uh, I'm okay, sure I butchered that, but there were more G's than I thought there were um, <laughs> in the name, but. Uh, Pretty cool uh, circuit and interesting seeing uh, that Herman Tilka had the uh, those other ones as well. Um, so very famous designer uh, in terms of those racetracks. Um, well, and clearly, clearly getting the private bag too. You know, for a, for a private track like that, that's uh, that's 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 pretty serious. Say say what you want about his tracks. I mean, he's uh, you know, he's at least doing well for the for the Tilka name. Yeah, he's. Uh, I'm. I'm sure he's doing okay for himself, uh, mm-hmm, designing mm-hmm, racetracks. Mm-hmm. But um, looking then, as as you had mentioned, the first race was in 2004 with the Chinese Grand Prix. Most recent race was 2019. So I was looking back then at 2019 uh, to see what drivers were not on the grid. So Lando Norris, of course, uh, Oscar Piastri, George Russell, Yuki Tsunoda. Zhou Guan Yu and Logan Sargent uh, were not there in 2019. Esteban Ocon mm-hmm. was also not racing there in 2019, but he did the year before. Um, mm. That was his off year when he was replaced at Renault by Daniel Ricciardo. Um, okay. So uh, a number five, or sorry, six different drivers on the grid who have never raced at this circuit. Um, along with that, we are in a a position where uh none of the new age and new era or current era of cars have raced at this circuit um with it being in 2019 the track's been resurfaced um so i think uh it'll be a very interesting upcoming race um and kind of seeing how that shakes out uh the last winner of course as you said multi-time winner lewis hamilton uh, one of his six wins at the circuit. Um, and of course, you mentioned Daniel Ricardo, but Fernando Alonso has also won twice at uh, the Chinese Grand Prix. So we have uh, three winners at, uh, of the circuit here at the race this weekend. Um, so we'll see. Maybe Ricardo can break out his stuff. That would be uh, definitely that would be definitely surprising. I think you would say um, objectively that he was finishing outside of you know he's he's finishing out of position definitely in that regard. Um, but yeah, three 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 winners of the race currently racing. That's that's quite exciting. I'm curious. You know, it kind of factors in um, with what has been stirring about the race like coming up a lot of the stuff that you mentioned is you know going to create what i think is going to be jeopardy for this weekend in the sense of you know we haven't been there in a while any data that you would have from the track is like way outdated and irrelevant because yeah as you have had said um the modern f1 cars have not raced on it they don't have you know good data in that regard it's going to be a sprint weekend format as well so i believe that means only one hour of free practice um Mm -hmm. the track has been resurfaced so even more it's going to be a a very green experience for the drivers and the teams uh so yeah there's a lot going on here for 
for this weekend's upcoming race thinking about just like how long we we haven't been there and how much teams and drivers rely on you know that feel from previous sessions uh they're not going to have a lot of opportunity to uh hearken to that uh experience or knowledge that they may have like you had said we have a bunch of first time drivers as well that are going to be racing on the track so just even more so it's going to be a just a mystery box like a literal black box of a weekend coming up here factoring in um a little bit of the history of it in the sense of you know we haven't been there for a while um but yeah that's that's some of the kind of like uh what would you say like historical elements that have modern implications for this this weekend's upcoming race um but one of the more interesting things that I find about doing these like get to knows or, you know, a, a classic race rewind is going back and learning about like some of the more famous races. What are the more exciting ones? Cause you know, we all know not, not every race is like a banger, you know, exciting things happening. Um, but in going back and rewatching, you know, uh, some of the Chinese grand prix, we find a couple of really solid races. Um, one of which is quite, quite popular with fans. Yeah, so the uh, the 2011 Chinese Grand Prix, um, I was doing a little research because I, I remembered looking up kind of uh, best race F1 races of all time to rewatch uh, list probably a couple of years ago um, and had gone back and, and watched this race, uh, but the 2011 Chinese Grand Prix is very highly rated among fans. Um, but it was just uh, a pretty exciting race across the board. Um, and looking at the upcoming Chinese Grand Prix we have, um, it I think there's some elements that maybe can be kind of taken from uh, the 2011 Chinese Grand Prix, particularly with the potential for different tire strategies to come out. Mm. Um, the as you had mentioned with the the circuit at the Shanghai Na International Circuit, there are a lot of tighter and slow speed corners. Um, I believe it's a pretty uh, front right heavy circuit. So looking out for tire wear uh, and what strategies different teams may go on, um, I wouldn't be surprised to, to see some differences between two stop three stop which is what we saw in the 2011 uh chinese grand prix there was a lot of discussion about uh even going into um the like eighth ninth tenth lap of the race talking about the drivers and uh kind of target um target laps for those tire changes and everything for the the pit windows um, in terms of which way they were going. They thought that the two-stop was going to be the uh, the quickest strategy, but um, towards the end of the race, realizing that the three-stop ends up being uh, kind of the optimal strategy there um, as you get to see uh, Mark Webber just come blasting through the field. Um, so very, very cool race to, to go back and watch. There was a lot of exciting moments. Uh, battles between legends like Sebastian Vettel and Lewis Hamilton for the race lead. Lewis uh, with some drama before the, the race even happened, barely making it to the grid. He had about 30 seconds left to get out of his, um, out of his garage and onto the circuit for the, uh, the I guess, grid lap and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, formation lap. So, um yeah, I couldn't remember if it was for the formation lap or uh, just with the um, that lap to get out on the grid. But either way, um, uh, pretty pretty interesting race overall to go from from that for Lewis all the way to to winning um, at by the end of the race. But uh, a pretty pretty exciting one to say the least. Yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons why that one is an exciting race. Like if you look down the grid, there's, you know, you could you could put it in quotations, but there's a bunch of legendary drivers on the grid, like all at one time, Alonzo, Vettel, Hamilton, um, Schumacher is racing, um, Felipe Massa is on the grid as well, Mark Webber's on the grid, Jensen Button's on the grid, um, 
those may be, you know, less recognition than like a Michael Schumacher or a Lewis, but like it was a, it was like a stacked season. Um, what I, I think is also quite interesting about the race is the gaps between cars was really, really small throughout like damn near the whole race. So mm. a bunch of competitive cars up and down the grid where like, anybody literally could have won that race is kind of what it felt like there were some younger drivers with good opportunities like their cars were pretty well tuned for the track for the time um or i don't want to say the time for like for their context in the race so there mm. were like some younger drivers that had the potential to do well and yeah i think the big standout obviously is the you know the mark weber podium p18 he starts to go you know charges through the grid for a p3 finish uh standing on the podium in in the red bull i believe um so very mm. exciting in that regard and like you know th this would be in formula one bloopers but you get the jensen button stopping in the wrong uh the wrong pit box yes like that's that's like wild and like kind of unheard of obviously that's like how the commentators felt and whatever but yeah that's that's not something you see every day uh so yeah i i think there are a bunch of different angles that you could look at the 2011 grand prix and say like oh yeah this this actually is like quite an exciting race yeah so a lot of those components and one thing that i um that they talked about as well during the race that i wish was uh came back into play more but the the difference in the the pace of the tires that uh the different tire compounds that were available during the race just seemed to make a really um big difference i mean seeing mark weber go for the three stop uh and then at the end just tearing through the field gaining at one point over two seconds per lap uh on the the cars ahead of him um that's not really a difference that we that we see that commonly anymore i feel like the tires maintain um themselves a lot better um without deteriorating due primarily of course to i assume safety reasons and whatnot but we don't see that um just like big difference as much in terms of the pace uh of the cars but also just one uh other interesting uh, uh aspect of the race we had uh drs being i believe 2011 was the first season that the drag reduction system was introduced so hearing the commentators uh and um broadcast talking about the drs and explaining it in very um very like simplified uh for the viewership and everything to to kind of be like this is a new thing that's like still we're just getting used to uh i believe there was a change to um not the drs detection point but during the weekend through the practice sessions they had changed the uh, line where you could open the DRS because they felt like uh, where they initially had it gave too much room on the straight for uh, cars to to make up too much ground so they were still tweaking some of those things um, but yeah just uh, overall uh, a really fun one to watch I would definitely recommend going back for anyone who wants to to see a good race lots of uh, great, great battles on the track. Vettel and Hamilton um, at the end. Vettel's defending was just unreal until Lewis was able to just hang on long enough for the DRS to, to do its job. Um, but Seb was driving so um, just defensively, but well. Uh, just mm -hmm. really putting the car in the perfect spot at every turn and, and utilizing all of his... Uh, his abilities well and at that junction like that's that's really just a microcosm of the uh the tire advantage that you were talking about where i'm uh, pretty sure lewis had younger tires in that regard um seb had had pitted a little bit earlier i think it might have been like seven laps or something like this um so just that just that tire life like really coming into play that'll just stop being able to defend at a certain point um the one thing that i think is interesting talking about the tires um this was the year that pirelli returned back to the formula one uh world championship so bridgestone was out 
Pirelli in. Um, so, you know, you could credit any of the uh, interesting racing due to the tire strategy. We can thank Pirelli for that, making some quality tires uh, for the race. But yeah, I think, like you had said, 2011 is a good one. Um, I'll throw out some, I'll throw out some notables here. 2009, Red Bull take their first victory ever with Sebastian Vettel from pole huge momentous day for the red bull family you know it's a it's a it's a milestone in what will you know then become a wild wild uh motor racing team you know from from that point on so that's the 2009 race and then in 2018 I know we have a lot of Daniel Ricardo fans in the uh, in our listeners here, so wanted to shout out his victory from sixth. Um, it, you know, like I said, sorry, 2018, uh, he was able to take advantage of a couple of squabbling Ferraris and then seal it off with an overtake on Valtteri Bottas, uh, at turn six, which, you know, keep your eye out for coming up this weekend. I believe, you know, a bunch of drivers will be taking advantage of that turn. Um, so yeah, 2011, 2009 and 2018 are a couple of standouts for me, uh, when I went back and, you know, caught up on the Chinese Grand Prix. Nice. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of uh, good races and, and hopefully we have another one. I think um, we've got uh, a lot of excitement for the weekend, as you said, with it being a sprint re weekend. But before we get into that, we just want to take a, a quick moment during the episode to just uh, ask that if you're enjoying the the episode, enjoying our um, content, Formula One opinions, if you're not enjoying them, uh, hit that like button, uh, subscribe. We're looking to, to grow the channel and everything and uh, be able to just interact more with the F1 community and, and put content out there. Um, so we appreciate you guys uh, going and doing that um, and supporting the channel. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Our goal, like we had said, 100 subscribers uh, by the end of by the end of the 2024 season. Um, so, so if you enjoy what we're doing, help us reach that goal. Hit that subscriber button. We really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, back to back to the episode. Yeah. So looking at the upcoming race, we talked about a lot of different aspects. The resurface track, uh, first time that the cars are here at the circuit. Um, but looking at this being a sprint race weekend um, and the kind of intensity of the track, some of the teams that um, I'm just kind of interested to see how they do, or, or maybe I'm kind of anticipating to drive a certain way. Um, I think that the Mercedes car with their struggles and everything that they've had um, may actually come out and, and have some good competitiveness at the circuit. They seem to, to not have too many issues in the slower speed corners. Um, so I think this circuit may hide some of the weaknesses of those like high speed corners that um, we've seen at some of the other circuits recently. Uh, Ferrari has looked very strong with those slow speed corners as well. Um, and of course, I think we can always just anticipate Red Bull to be competing for those front positions. But um, I do kind of expect for the McLaren squad, who are so dominant on those medium to high speed corners, uh, to potentially have a little bit more of a struggle this week. Um, so I, I'm kind of keeping an eye on them to see how that goes. Uh, I think the qualifying will be a big um, I mean, it's always important, but I think that can be a big key as I don't anticipate them necessarily being able to make up too many places um, with the uh, kind of not as good top speeds with the Mercedes engine on the straightaways. And if they struggle in those uh, slower speed corners, they might... Um, kind of fall behind Aston, potentially Mercedes, uh, for, for just the, the race this weekend. Yeah. And that's actually like one of the big, um, uh, what would you say? Like points that points that I'm looking at going into, going into this weekend's race is the, um, 
competition between, like you had said, Mercedes and Aston Martin, because right now they they are like their main competition with each other. Um, they're a little far afield of McLaren ahead of them, and the teams below them are are a bit far away as well. I think they would need to string some good results together to to really like dent into that that consistent lead that i think mercedes and aston martin you know you could guess they're gonna scoop up some amount of points every weekend um but yeah it seems like they are like they're each other's biggest competition obviously in the constructors um so keeping keeping a tight eye there that's that's actually a really good call out for their um their car maybe uh doing pretty well here you know for for mercedes um but yeah that's that's a big one for me the the battle between Red Bull and Ferrari, I think, at the top of the field is is really exciting. Um, mm. You're talking about qualifying being important. You know, we may see we may see a good qualifying performance out of Charles. Always, always good on Saturdays. Uh, so we'll see if they're able to utilize that strength that they have uh, to give them a good good position on Sunday. But yeah, with the with the sprint weekend as well, there is just oodles of points available for these teams uh so yeah we'll see you know we'll, we'll see who's coming out on top but i but i really think the big moves are going to be mercedes and aston um we could see some big shifts in that in that regard yeah um i i definitely agree i and i think that um one of the other keys just for the teams this weekend is going to be l- which teams um have had the best kind of luck in terms of uh, initially figuring out setups because with just that one practice session, of course, you'll be able to gather some data during uh, the the sprint race and sprint qualifying and all, but of course, you won't be able to continue to make those tweaks and changes um, throughout the, the weekend like you could with multiple practice sessions. So teams that have been able to, to lock it in um, and Red Bull recently has not been one of those teams. So that can kind of uh, potentially leave some some bit of the door open for, like you said, Ferrari to, to be really competitive because they seem to have done a better job with uh, dialing that in even last week at the Japanese Grand Prix reading it or two weeks ago leading into the race weekend. Uh, Max was talking about uh, ahead of the race that he was not super thrilled with the the setup for the car or kind of how they had dialed that in. Um, and so maybe some some struggles with different teams can can mix up the standings a little bit, open the doors maybe to the points for some of the lower midfield. Um, but yeah, a lot to a lot to play for and uh, Talking about the lower midfield, two of those teams uh, bringing upgrades to this weekend as well. Um, so, of course, not necessarily um, as great of an opportunity as you would hope to be able to dial in those upgrades and get them working. Uh, so it, it could be um, a little bit of a, a double-edged sword with the um, improvements that these upgrades hopefully will bring. Um, but alongside with that, the, the potential for the car to feel different, for the drivers to maybe struggle a little bit with that new uh, feel if the it really affects kind of that in-car feel for the drivers. Um, mm-hmm. But Haas bringing in, as we had talked about, one a kind of smaller upgrade um, early in the season as opposed to going for these big upgrades that they just kind of uh, throw in later on in the season typically um, so they're they're bringing a number of smaller improvements instead of a large package upgrade um, but one of the struggles or, or kind of interesting things with Haas um, is that they they have had so far this year kind of a, a different um, or the opposite problem of Mercedes I was reading an article um, I believe it was on the uh, formula, formula Uno, um, where it was talking about how Haas's car is actually going faster than, uh, their simulator, like kind of expects it to. So okay. they're 
it's good because they're doing better. Um, however, not knowing necessarily why the data is not matching up, kind of like mm-hmm. Mercedes on the other end of the spectrum being slower than their simulations anticipate and not knowing why that data isn't matching up. So the the Haas car, they're still figuring some of these things out, but maybe this upgrade package will um, give them a, a little bit more of a dialed in car to, to start getting that, um, I guess, more in line what they expect so that they can really fine tune some of the the weaker points of the car or um, make some of the improvements where they're they're most needed um, but I, I thought that was a pretty pretty interesting problem I guess to have with uh, the car being faster than you expect it to well yeah there's a couple of interesting weekends that you could look at in 2023 for Alexander Albon and Williams there's a a few post-race interviews with Albon where he talks about them really not understanding why they were quick. Um, There's a couple of weekends, I think it was on the straight heavy circuits uh, last year where they knew they were quick, but they didn't know why. Um, And that is a fascinating issue to have um, where it seems easier to not know why you're slow Oh, uh, but it seems just as reasonable to not understand why you're quick. Um, so yeah, some some fascinating issues with regards to the upgrade package. But yeah, thinking thinking of it strategically, smart that it's not massive in regards to them not having a lot of correlation time to understand, you know, um, how these upgrades are affecting their package aerodynamically and and so on. Yeah, and uh, looking at looking at the other team that's kind of in the, a similar position, um, Alpine bringing in an upgrade for the Chinese Grand Prix. Um, I think they'll have a bit better of a time actually understanding it um, in this instance than Haas, but that's because uh, they fast tracked this upgrade. Um, it was intended to be for the next race in Miami, but it is a uh, upgrade to the floor. Uh, that will be only on Esteban Ocon's car this weekend. So they'll have uh, one car uh, using both sa- uh, the the new floor, the old floor, which I think gives a lot of good data um, around the circuit in terms of just across the whole race weekend um, to be able to see how that upgrade does, especially since I feel like Esteban and uh, Pierre have both been driving at a pretty similar uh, level or they're, they're typically pretty close to each other in terms of uh, positions and, and finishing throughout the year so far. Um, so the, I feel like that's a, a pretty good level playing field to some extent to be able to uh, see the differences and the improvements. But I, I appreciate them rushing to get that floor done um, so that they can try to do something on the track. Dude, you're talking this whole time and it's I'm literally like in physical pain just <laughs> thinking about like how out of the ball game they are. Like y- you understand that concept of like like you're just getting stomped so hard in game 2 that you're not even talking about strategies for game 2. Like you you've seeded defeat and you're just now using this as like a long time out to talk about you know the plan for the next game (laughs) and how we're gonna bounce back this totally feels like a haas abandoned ship we're not caring about this car we're thinking about the next year this is this is all one long trial to figure out why our car is just so bad just (laughs) out yeah I mean, I'm in physical pain trying to like come up with a with a positive angle for you to uh I to mean come at. I I don't know if there is much positive available right now and I don't know if they deserve uh to to have one talked about. They haven't shown that they are in a position to fight for much of anything except maybe mm-hmm. not to be last um when when Logan Sargent makes a mistake, but it's it's a problem uh and hopefully this is 
uh, a step in the right direction. Like I said, they fast tracked it, probably spent a little more budget than they would have to, to get it done sooner. But I just hope that by pushing forward with these upgrades and updates that they can drag themselves towards the back of the grid a little bit instead of being mm -hmm. off the back of the grid. Um, but we'll, we'll get to see, uh, and hopefully get a good idea of how those upgrades do comparing the, the two cars. But, um, but the other team that, uh, I have some just dread for, for this weekend is, uh, as you had mentioned the Williams squad, but, uh, after the Japanese Grand Prix and evaluating damage and all to Alex Albon's chassis after the collision with, uh, sorry, Alex Albon, Logan Sargent's chassis that after the collision with Daniel Ricciardo, both chassis are now uh, officially considered damaged and have had to be patched back together and repaired to be able to, to drive for this weekend. Uh, I anticipate them having two cars, but they're not supposed to have their third chassis uh, ready to go until next uh, race in Miami. So it's pretty, pretty dire straits at the moment for them, especially with the sprint weekend. Um, we'll hopefully see them really be pretty cautious and, and hopefully give a little extra leeway in the sprint race to, to not necessarily knock themselves out of contention to be able to come to the race on Sunday. Right. Um, but just a, a bad, bad to worse kind of situation for the Williams team um, who so far has uh, amassed over, I believe it was uh over $2 million of repair costs thus far. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. last year, the teams at the, the back or the, the lowest um, repair costs for teams, uh, that $2 million plus is more than at the very least three of the teams had across the 2023 season more than Mercedes, Alfa Romeo, and Haas had across all of 2023. Um, just a, a really tough position. And of course, the, it's, it's not that different to them than last year. Last year, they led the, uh, the repair costs by uh, about 2.7 million with 5.7 million total over Alpine at the second with about 3 million. Um, so they, they're getting these venture capitalist funding and at the moment they are just eating through any money they have with repair costs and all, which is, which is brutal because I, I think we had pretty high hopes for them to be able to maintain their kind of, improvement that we saw last year across the season um but now sitting in eighth in the constructors championship um with zero points currently tied with with kick sauber and alpine um just the a really tough spot to be and and i'm very anxious for them with this sprint weekend um mm -hmm. They're going to have to be super, super careful across practice sessions and, and everything. No spins, no uh, going off into the into the gravel, into the wall. They, they have to really be, be smart about how they approach the weekend. For sure. Yeah, I think it puts the drivers in a position where they have to drive and not lose they can't drive to win um whatever winning is for williams like on on any given weekend because obviously their 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 idea of success is different than like a red bulls or a ferrari's is right um so yeah in in whatever definition that is they have to they have to just 
like you said, they, you got to be careful. You have to like give room, you know, it's, they, they're just going to get bullied by Hulkenberg until they can, um, until they can get a third chassis going. It's, no, it's tough. It's going like, to be Magnuson. Magnuson's the one who he's the disruptor. <laughs> there you go there you go you're right um but yeah just just uh tough tough for williams in that regard but i mean yeah you know that's all at the at the back of the pack i think there's a bunch of exciting racing to look forward to at the front um a lot of a lot of parity between the red bulls and the ferraris like we said competitive mclarens the mercedes and the aston martins going toe to toe um so yeah you know the engineering and developmental woes aside from some of the bottom running teams um i still think there's some you know definite definite positives to look forward to coming into the weekend yeah it should be it should be an exciting one um i unfortunately don't think i'll be watching it live with a, a mm. 3 a.m race start time i will uh probably try and and just get up and watch it first thing in the morning um, for sure but hopefully i'll i'll get to catch some i think one of the uh sprint races is going to be at starting at 11 or the sprint race should be at 11 p.m eastern time i think uh Whoa. so might be able to uh to catch that on the weekend um oh, that wouldn't be bad yeah sprint race will be uh for us, it will still be Friday night at 11, uh, 11 p.m. So we'll get to catch that, um, but we'll be uh, catching the race afterwards. Yeah, for sure. That's definitely going to be a, an on-demand type thing. Uh, but yeah, I think this was a very informative uh, little look at the Chinese Grand Prix. I know I definitely learned a lot um, knowing that a bunch of tracks are designed by, you know, by basically one guy. I thought that was um, definitely surprising for me to learn that. Uh, but yeah, Aaron, let's, uh, let's, let's get these people out of here. Let's hit them with the cool down lap. What do you got for me this week? Sounds good. So we've got the uh, Rose Thorn and Seed this week for the cool down lap. So uh, my Rose this week is I am just ecstatic about the warmer weather, it being nice out and all. Um, I spent most of my day Sunday, um, well, just had a nice weekend overall. I saw one of our buddies, Tom, for his birthday on Saturday, had some uh, some decent weather for that. It wasn't too cold out or anything, uh, but Sunday got a lot of yard work done and work around the house with the good weather. Um, oh, yeah. So that's my uh, my rose for, for this week. My thorn is as I've been uh, training for uh, an upcoming race and everything running, um, I've just started to have this residual knee pain that, I, that I've continued to just deal with over uh, the years, unfortunately. And so that's coming back to, to start kind of cropping up, um, and has put a, a little kink in my training plans and all. Um, but I've started using a, uh, like CBD gel lotion nice. type thing, um, that has helped a lot, at least in terms of, um, any sort of pain. It really relieves mm -hmm. that. So, the uh, inflammation issues that I have that I can't really, I'm unfortunately allergic to the medicines that would help me with inflammation. Mm. Uh, that topical um, kind of option has, has been a big help. Um, Hell yeah. But I still at the same time um, doesn't resolve the issue itself. So of course. it helps deal with kind of those, those symptoms, but um, still trying to figure out how to get past that uh that barrier a little bit um but then my seed for this week it's actually just uh upcoming tomorrow but i'm gonna be going to a phillies baseball game with uh nice. my co-workers uh and colleen is gonna come along as well which will be cool so she'll get to uh meet the different folks who i uh talk about on a, a daily basis get to get a better feel for them and all and so that'll um make our, our conversations a little she'll have a better eye of like who these people are for sure i've met a couple of her co-workers and so when she talks about certain ones i'm like yep I, that makes sense um so that'll be fun um but having this contact with the phillies organization um 
that I have through work and all has been nice getting it, being able to, to reach out, set up tickets for the office to go and everything. Mm. Um, it'll be a, a fun, fun time. Damn, yeah, it's really not about what you know, it's about who you know. But goddamn, a weekday a weekday game? Six o'clock start, so it'll be Dude, done. You're by living like large though. And yeah, we'll be we'll be in good shape, so no late night. Um, That's great. Yeah. it'll it'll be a lot of fun, but looking forward to it. Uh but Justin, what do you have for the Rose Thorn and Seed this week? Oh, I've got I've actually got some something pretty interesting for you. So when Sarah and I moved from previous address to current address, we had like a bunch of different wall hangings that we we never we never got up. We have a decent amount of stuff on the wall, but like there are some things that were like, you know, in a box or folded up and in my drawer. Um, so one of the fun things that I did recently was found all of those you know, wall hangings. I have a a few that haven't been hung up. And a couple of things that are, like, that the cats have knocked over on Sarah's desk. She's she's a leaner. She likes to just, like, lean a bunch of stuff. But it, uh, you know, just inevitably gets knocked yeah. over. Um, so we hung a bunch of that up. So, like, she, she, she's got some wall art now. And my Oblivion and shivering isles maps that come with like the collector's edition of that game got those yeah. in frames got those hung up so like i'm 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 really enjoying that so that's my rose here for the week is clearing out that backlog and then my thorn here a client that is traditionally quite difficult uh where like a bunch of stuff about the appointment is presented in one way you know it, it just gives me a particular i don't want to say fears but like it definitely i'm more aware of more aware of the scenario when you get a couple of these like i don't want to say red flags but yellow flags for sure so what i would say is a previous hard mode massage which would have been like uh, this is like really tough it weighs on me i experience a lot of fear I did not have that this time. I was uh, able to use some mindfulness, um, mm. engage the five P's, and um, I I really, really, you know, A, believe and know that I did a good job on, on this session, which previously I definitely would not have if I had I not learned, um, you know, a new set of skills, really uh, have some have some self-criticism and say like, okay, what can I be doing better? Well, I've improved on those things. And this was a client that would have been won or lost on that skill specifically. And I got the reschedule at the end of the session. So I was very pleased with that. If you don't know the five P's, proper preparation prevents poor performance. It's okay. uh, it's something that's that's helped me a lot. So, that, so that's my thorn here for the week. Something nice. that has previously gone bad. I was able to, to turn the page on totally. And then my seed here for the week, as I talked about, we had upgraded our sound system for the office. A couple of, couple of weeks in now, we've had a bunch of use out of it. We fucking love it. It's so good. Um, but the seed in that is now the next step. I'm going to look to get hopefully a a better door for the office, like a main door. Right now, it's just like plywood. I want to get like a door that has a core, maybe is even like a little heavier so we can kind of buffer out some of the sound that comes from the hallway and really just create like a just a vacuum seal of an environment so people can just kind of just literally forget the world around them um, and just really be able to relax. Uh, so that's, that's what we're looking for next. Now that we had this one goal, you know, checked off the list, which feels good, you know, got to put another one up how can we improve uh, and i think that's that's going to be a way to significantly improve nice i love it and has the uh the music stayed on the massage playlists or do you mix it around uh between your own music and massage music i've just kept it on the massage music i honestly <laughs> think i've been like missing out on a bit of treatment like i it feels like my clients are more relaxed on okay. the table than truly they ever have been and whether that's like 
just placebo effect or whatever i'm i'm running with it i i i I think it's a good change um there may be clients who you know prefer this or that but i think my default now is just going to be the massage music i've actually found like i'm able to even like focus better on the client where previously i thought i focused better having something to like kind of track to Mm. that's actually false i i focus better with just you know the the melodic sounds i'm able to kind of like really zone in on what i'm doing um so yeah i think i think beneficial all around nice do you guys have Mm -hmm. any uh, others i'm just out of curiosity do you have any other uh environmental things in the in the massage like room like uh little water things like those little bubbler water fountain things that mm. have the little yeah we just bubbler. have a sound machine okay i was just scared mm. i because i feel like uh some of those other things with the massage music might blend well together um and it does you're right but uh but yeah very cool and it's uh it's exciting all those little improvements and everything whether it's like uh at the um studio or like here when i'm doing stuff at the house like it it is such a good feeling so i'm sure you're you're pretty pumped about all that oh yeah it's great it's just value added for our clients too and at the end of the day like that's just what i care about most um so yeah that's my rose thorn and seed here for the week that gives you guys your little cool down lap a little bit of us at the end of these uh very motorsport focused episodes um but yeah if you've uh if, if if you've made it this far, you're an animal. We we, we really appreciate you. Um, just want to say thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, be sure to catch us next time. Aaron? Yeah. Uh, enjoy the Chinese Grand Prix this weekend. I don't recommend staying up for it if you're uh, Eastern, Eastern time, but if you do, uh, again, you're an animal. Go for it. Have at it. Have fun. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll catch you next, catch you next week. Um, see you guys. Peace out, everyone.